This is the reading of Open Wide Our Hearts, a essay or statement by the United States Council of Catholic Bishops, and my subsequent remarks on the said letter. Open Wide Our Hearts, The Enduring Call to Love, a pastoral letter against racism by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, is approved by a full body of bishops, formal statement, November 2018, general meetings been authorized for publication. The Holy Scripture boldly proclaims, See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are, unquote. 1 John 3, 1. This love, quote, comes from God and unites us to God. Through this unifying process, it makes us a we, which transcends our divisions and makes us one until in the end God is all in all." Unquote. 1 Corinthians 15.28 By the work of the Holy Spirit, the Church is called to share with all the world this gift of love. As Pope Francis points out, quote, "...the salvation which God has wrought, and the Church joyfully proclaims, is for everyone. God has found a way to unite himself to every human being in every age." Unquote. Through his cross and resurrection, Christ united the one human race to the Father. However, even though Christ's victory over sin and death is complete, we still live in a world affected by them. As bishops of the Catholic Church of the United States, we want to address this one particularly destructive and persistent form of evil. Despite many promising strides made in our country, racism still infects our nation. What is racism? Racism arises when, either consciously or unconsciously, a person holds that his or her own race is ethnically superior, and therefore judges persons of other races or ethnicities as inferior and unworthy of equal regard. When this conviction or attitude leads individuals or groups to exclude, ridicule, mistreat, or unjustly discriminate against persons on the basis of their race or ethnicity, it is sinful. Racist acts are sinful because they violate justice. They reveal a failure to acknowledge the human dignity of the persons offended, to recognize them as the neighbors Christ calls us to love. Matthew 22:39. Racism occurs because a person ignores the fundamental truth that, because all humans share a common origin, they are all brothers and sisters, all equally made in the image of God. When this truth is ignored, the consequence is prejudice and fear of the other, and all too often hatred. Cain forgets this truth in his hatred of his brother. Recall the words in the first letter of John. Quote, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. Unquote. 1 John 3.15 Racism shares in the same evil that moved Cain to kill his brother. It arises from suppressing the truth that his brother Abel was also created in the image of God, a human equal to himself. Every racist act, every comment, every joke, Every disparaging look as a reaction to the color of the skin, ethnicity, or place of origin is a failure to acknowledge another person as a brother or sister created in the image of God. In these, and in many other such acts, the sin of racism persists in our lives, in our country, and in our world. Racism comes in many forms. It can be seen in deliberate sinful acts. In recent times, we have seen bold expressions of racism by groups as well as of individuals. The reappearance of symbols of hatred, such as nooses and swastikas in public spaces, is a tragic indicator of rising racial and ethnic animus. All too often, Hispanics and African Americans, for example, face discrimination in hiring, housing, educational opportunities, and incarceration. Racial profiling frequently targets Hispanics for selective immigration enforcement practices and African Americans for suspected criminal activity. There is also the growing fear and harassment of persons from majority Muslim countries. Extreme nationalist ideologies are feeding the American public discourse with xenophobic rhetoric that instigates fear against foreigners, immigrants, and refugees. Finally, too often, racism comes in the form of the sin of omission, when individuals, communities, and even churches remain silent and fail to act against racial injustice when it is encountered. Racism can often be found in our hearts, in many cases placed there unwillingly or unknowingly by our upbringing and culture. As such, it can lead to thoughts and actions that we do not even see as racist, but nonetheless flow from the same prejudicial root. Consciously or subconsciously, this attitude of superiority can be seen in how certain groups of people are vilified, called criminals, or perceived as being unable to contribute to society, even unworthy of its benefits. Racism can also be institutional, when practices or traditions are upheld 
that treat certain groups of people unjustly. The cumulative effect of personal sins of racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that make us all accomplices in racism. We read the headlines that report the killing of unarmed African Americans by law enforcement officials. In our prisons, the number of inmates of color, notably those who are brown and black, is grossly disproportionate. Despite the great blessings of liberty that this country offers, we must admit the plain truth that for many of our fellow citizens who have done nothing wrong, interactions with the police are often fraught with fear and even danger. At the same time, we reject harsh rhetoric that belittles and dehumanizes law enforcement personnel who labor to keep our community safe. We also condemn violent acts against police. We have also seen years of systemic racism working in how resources are allocated to communities that remain de facto segregated. As an example, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, resulting from policy decisions that negatively affected the inhabitants, the majority of whom were African Americans. We could go on for the instances of discrimination, prejudice, and racism, sadly, are too many. At significant times in our history, the bishops have written to express their pastoral concern over the scourge of racism, which some have called our country's original sin. In 1958, the bishops wrote to condemn the blatant forces of racism found in the segregation and Jim Crow laws. Ten years later, they wrote to condemn the scandal of racism and the policies and actions that led to so much frustration that violence erupted in many cities. In 1979, the bishops wrote on how racism still affects so many of our brothers and sisters, highlighting the structural and institutional forms of racial injustice evident in the economic imbalances found in our society. With the positive changes that arose from the civil rights movement and related civil rights legislation, some may believe that racism is no longer a major affliction of our society, that it is only found in the hearts of individuals who can be dismissed as ignorant or unenlightened. But racism still profoundly affects our culture, and it has no place in the Christian heart. This evil causes great harm to its victims, and it corrupts the souls of those who harbor racist or prejudicial thoughts. The persistence of the evils of racism is why we are writing this letter now. People are still being harmed, so action is still needed. What is needed, and what we are calling for, is a genuine conversion of heart, a conversion that will compel change and reform our institutions and society. Conversion is a long road to travel for the individual. Moving our nation to a full realization of the promise of liberty, equality, and justice for all is even more challenging. However, in Christ we can find the strength and the grace necessary to make that journey. In this regard, each of us should adopt the words of Pope Francis as our own. Let no one, quote, think that this invitation is not meant for him or her, unquote. All of us are in need of personal ongoing conversion. Our churches and our civic and social institutions are in need of ongoing reform. If racism is confronted by addressing its causes and the injustices it produces, then healing can occur. In that transformed reality, the headlines we all too often see today will become lessons from the past. How do we overcome this evil of rejecting a brother or sister's humanity, the same evil that provoked Cain's sin? What are the necessary steps that would lead to this conversion? We find our inspiration in the words of the prophet Micah. Quote, you have been told, O mortal, what is good, and what the Lord requires of you, only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. Unquote. Micah 6, 8. To do justice requires an honest acknowledgement of our failures and the restoring of right relationship between us. Quote, if we acknowledge our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. Unquote. 1 John 1, 9. To love goodness demands pursuing, quote, what leads to peace and to building up one another. Unquote. Romans 14, 19. It requires a determined effort, but even more so, it requires humility. It requires each of us to ask for the grace needed to overcome this sin and get rid of this scourge. In what follows, we hope to provide a Christian call for all of us in this country to, quote, walk humbly with our God, unquote, so that by his grace, racism will be eradicated. Do justice. For a nation to be just, it must be a society that recognizes and respects the legitimate rights of individuals and peoples. These rights precede any society because they flow from the dignity created to each person as created by God. We are reminded of this fundamental truth in the earliest passages of the book of Genesis. Quote, then God said, let us make human beings in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame animals, all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Unquote. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. 
From Revelation, we know that the one God who created the human race is triune, a communion of truth and love. And so, by faith, we recognize all the more clearly that human beings are, by their very nature, made for communion. Pope Benedict XVI noted, quote, As a spiritual being, the human creature is defined through interpersonal relations. The more authentically he or she lives these relations, the more his or her own personal identity matures. It is not by isolation that man establishes his worth, but by placing himself in relation with others and with God." Unquote. We are meant to love God with our whole being, which then overflows into love for our neighbor. Quote, Whoever loves God must love his brother. Unquote. 1 John 4, 21. This is the original meaning of justice, where we are in right relationship with God, with one another, and with the rest of God's creation. Justice was a gift of grace given to all of humanity. After sin entered the world, however, this sense of justice was overtaken by selfish desires, and we became inclined to sin. St. Augustine described well our lives after Eden, saying that in the fallen world our relationships with one another have been guided by a, quote, lust to dominate, unquote. Whether recognized or not, the history of the injustice is done to so many because of their race flows from this, quote, lust to dominate, unquote, the other. Even when we are freed from original sin by baptism, we continue to struggle with overcoming temptation and sin in our lives. Although our nation has moved forward in a number of ways against racial discrimination, we have lost ground in others. Despite significant progress in civil law with regard to racism, societal realities indicate a need for further catechesis to facilitate conversion of hearts. Too many good and faithful Catholics remain unaware of the connection between institutional racism and the continued erosion of the sanctity of life. We are not finished with the work. The evil of racism festers in part because, as a nation, there have been very limited formal acknowledgments of the harm done to so many. No moment of atonement, no national process of reconciliation, and all too often a neglect of our history. Many of our institutions still harbor, and too many of our laws still sanction, practices that deny justice and equal access to certain groups of people. God demands more from us. We cannot, therefore, look upon the progress against racism in recent decades and conclude that our current situation meets the standards of justice. In fact, God demands what is right and just. As Christians, we are called to listen and know the stories of our brothers and sisters. We must create opportunities to hear, with open hearts, the tragic stories that are deeply imprinted on the lives of our brothers and sisters, if we are to be moved with empathy to promote justice. Many groups, such as the Irish, Italians, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Poles, Jews, Chinese, and Japanese, can attest to having been the target of racial and ethnic prejudice in this country. It is also true that many groups are still experiencing prejudice including rising anti-Semitism, the discrimination many Hispanics face today, and anti-Muslim sentiment. Especially instructive at the moment, however, are the historical and contemporary experiences of Native and African Americans. The Native American Experience Before Europeans arrived, this land already had many diverse peoples upon it, with varying customs, languages, and beliefs. As explorers and then pioneers arrived, relations with Native Americans also varied, but were mostly to the detriment of Native peoples. Native Americans experienced deep wounds in the age of colonization and expansion, wounds that largely remain unhealed and strongly impact the generations to this day, a fact that St. John Paul II recognized when he met with Native peoples in 1987. Quote, the early encounter between your traditional cultures and the European way of life was an event of such significance and change that it profoundly influences your collective life even today. That encounter was a harsh and painful reality for your peoples. The cultural oppression, the injustices, the disruption of your life and of your traditional societies must be acknowledged." Unquote. Many European settlers were blind to the dignity of the indigenous peoples. Colonial and later U.S. policies toward Native American communities were often violent, paternalistic, and were directed toward the theft of their land. Native Americans were killed, imprisoned, sold into slavery, and raped. These policies decimated entire communities and brought about tragic death. The results were massive, forced relocations of people, such as the forced removal of the Cherokee people from the southeast to the western territories along the Trail of Tears, and of the Navajo in the Long Walk. Thousands of men, women, and children died during those forced removals. The forced relocation of peoples occurred again and again due to the idea that if these indigenous peoples interfered with progress, they should be pushed aside. Quote, unquote. In many boarding schools and orphanages, the objective was to, quote, Americanize, unquote, native children by forcing them to abandon all facets of their culture, including their native languages. In the words of the superintendent of one school, the goal was to, quote, kill the Indian and save the man, unquote. During this time, there were missions that stood as a barrier to the abuse of indigenous peoples and provided a form of protection in a rapidly changing reality. 
Although not all encounters with missionaries were benign, a number of missionaries heroically defended Native Americans as they sought to bring the good news of Christ to many who had yet to hear it. The Jesuit Friar Pierre-Jean de Smot and the Franciscan Anselm Weber, for example, worked tirelessly in supporting and promoting Native American rights. Earlier, St. Junipero Serra frequently clashed with civil authorities over the treatment of Native peoples. Many, but certainly not all, Native peoples accepted the gospel willingly. For instance, St. Katiri Tekalawitha, Nicholas William Black Elk Sr., and the martyrs of La Florida missions were moved by Christ's message of love and by the example of Christians who honored their dignity. Yet, in the order of natural justice, these acts done in the power of Christ's spirit are overshadowed by the devastation caused by policies of expansion and manifest destiny, fueled by racist attitudes that led to the near eradication of Na Native American peoples and their cultures. The effects of this evil remain visible in the great difficulties experienced by Native American communities today. Poverty, unemployment, inadequate health care, poor schools, the exploitation of natural resources, and disputes over land ownership are all factors that cannot and should not be ignored. The truth that we must face is straightforward. When one culture meets another, lack of awareness and understanding often leads to grossly distorted value judgments and prejudice. This prejudice fuels attitudes of superiority that are embedded in and reinforced by social structures and laws. This is evident in how white European immigrants and pioneers acted in their encounters with Native Americans, and it is equally evident in the treatment of Africans who were enslaved and brought to the shores of America. The African American Experience As this country was forming, Africans were bought and sold as mere property, often beaten, raped, and literally worked to death. This form of slavery, known as chattel slavery, was different from and far more brutal than the slavery known in ancient times. Racial categories, which classified different ethnic communities as different races, some even as subhuman, were used to justify this new form of slavery. The injustices of chattel slavery were horrifying and lasted for generations. Families were separated, marriages were forbidden or dishonored, and children were maltreated and forced to work. After slavery ended, many former slaves faced continued servitude in the evolving economies that once relied upon their labor, and blacks encountered new forms of resentment and violence. In freedom, millions of blacks lived in constant fear for their lives. Most resided in extreme poverty and endured daily indignities in their interactions with whites. Efforts to advance out of poverty by working a small farm, owning a business, building a school, or forming a trade union generally met fierce resistance throughout the country. For so many, the right to participate in the political process would be withheld or severely hindered for another century. Consistently, African Americans have been branded by individual society and even, at times, by members of the church with a message that they are inferior. Likewise, this message has been imprinted into U.S. social subconscious. African Americans continue to struggle against perceptions that they do not fully bear the image of God, that they embody less intelligence, beauty, and goodness. This reality represents more than a few isolated stories. It was the lived experience of the vast majority of African Americans for most of our national history. We acknowledge with gratitude the religious orders whose charism embodied evangelizing and caring for those who were marginalized and unwelcomed. We recall the bold witness of the Divine Word missionaries, the Oblate Sisters of Providence, Sisters of the Holy Family, the Josephites, the Franciscan Handmaids of Mary, and the Blessed Sacrament Sisters. Likewise, countless individuals, Daniel Rudd, Thomas Wyatt Turner Sr., Taya Brauman, and Dr. Lena Edwards, to name a few, worked tirelessly against the prevailing current of racism to share the Catholic faith with persons of African descent. Still, to understand how racism works today, we must recognize that generations of African Americans were disadvantaged by slavery, wage theft, Jim Crow laws, and by the systemic denial of access to numerous wealth-building opportunities reserved for others. This has left many African Americans without hope, discouraged, disheartened, and feeling unloved. While it is true that some individuals and families have thrived, significant numbers of African Americans are born into economic and social disparity. The poverty experienced by many of these communities has its roots in racist policies that continue to impede the ability of people to find affordable housing, meaningful work, adequate education, and social mobility. The generational effects of slavery, segregation, and the systemic use of violence, including the lynching of more than 4,000 black men, women, and children across 800 different counties throughout the United States between 1877 and 1950, are realities that must be fully recognized and addressed in any process that hopes to combat racism. The Hispanic Experience Of course, experiencing racism is not limited to African or Native Americans. Many different groups of people have encountered Quote, in varying degrees, the evil of discrimination, racial prejudice, and oppression that endangers the very fabric of American society. Unquote. Some of the same patterns of prejudice and discrimination have been repeated. 
At this time, we would be remiss not to highlight the experience of Hispanics in our country. Since the American-Mexican War, Hispanics from various countries have experienced discrimination in housing, employment, health care, and education. Hispanics have been referred to by countless derogatory names, have encountered negative assumptions made about them because of their ethnicity, have suffered discrimination in applying for college, for housing, and in registering to vote, despite their sizable share of the U.S. workforce and their numerous contributions to U.S. economy in many different fields and industries, the large income gap between Hispanic and European Americans points to the persistence of certain discriminatory practices in employment and pay. In the not-too-distant past, Hispanics encountered signs in restaurants and shops that read, quote, no Mexicans or blacks allowed, unquote. Moreover, there have been over 550 documented cases of Hispanics being lynched, and experts estimate that the number could actually be twice as large. Hispanics are the major target of immigration raids and mass deportation. In the past, U.S. citizens of Hispanic descent caught up in these raids have been deported. Today, many Hispanics are often assumed to be in this country illegally. These attitudes of cultural superiority, indifference, and racism need to be confronted. They are unworthy of any follower of Christ. After all, a large part of our nation consists of immigrants and their descendants. We must also remember that many people of Hispanic heritage come from families that were in this land long before the borders changed. These examples from the experiences of Native African Hispanic Americans demonstrate how, as a nation, we have never sufficiently contended with the impact of overt racism, nor have we spent the necessary time to examine where racist attitudes of yesterday have become a permanent part of our perceptions, practices, and policies of today, or how they have been enshrined in our social, political, and economic structures. Much can be learned in hearing the stories of those who have lived through the effects of racism. In examining the generational differences of racism on families, communities, and our church, each of us can begin to act in solidarity to change the prospects for future generations. Love, goodness. Most people would not consider themselves to be racist. A person might admit to being prejudiced, but certainly not racist. As Christians, we know that it is our duty to love others. St. Paul reminds us that we live by the Spirit, and the, quote, Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Unquote. Galatians 5, 22-23. We must be honest with ourselves. Each of us should examine our conscience and ask if these fruits are really present in our attitudes about race. Or rather, do our attitudes reflect mistrust, impatience, anger, distress, discomfort, or rancor? When we begin to separate peoples in our thoughts for unjust reasons, when we start to see people as them and others as us, we fail to love. Yet love is at the heart of the Christian life. When approached and asked, what is the greatest commandment, Jesus answered, quote, You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Unquote. Matthew 22, 37 through 39. This command of love can never be simply, quote, live and let others be, unquote. The command of love requires us to make room for others in our hearts. It means that we are indeed our brother's keeper. Genesis 4, 9. The sin of Cain finds its renovity in Christ and his command to love and in the gift of his Holy Spirit that enables us to respond to his call. When Cain struck and killed his brother, the human family was further divided. But Christ heals all divisions, including those that are at the core of racism. It is through his cross that we learn the greatest lesson about love. On the cross, Jesus died for the human race. See 2 Corinthians 5.15. Quote, He is expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. Unquote. 1 John 2.2. 2. Here is our hope. Here is the grace given to us. To be healed of this sin of division, here is the lesson of love. Once, quote, we have come to the conviction that one died for all, unquote, and not just for ourselves, then, quote, the love of Christ impels us, unquote, to see others as our brothers and sisters, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For, quote, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy, unquote, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. It is the love of Christ that binds together the church, and this love reaches out beyond the church to all peoples. This love also requires justice. Quote, if we love others with charity, unquote, as Pope Benedict the Sixteenth reminds us, quote, then first of all, we are just toward them, unquote. In this way, love, quote, is an extraordinary force which leads people to opt for courageous and generous engagement in the field of justice and peace, unquote. In doing so, we are also loving goodness. The Urgent Call of Love 
Love compels each of us to resist racism courageously. It requires us to reach out generously to the victims of this evil, to assist the conversion needed in those who still harbor racism, and to begin to change policies and structures that allow racism to persist. Overcoming racism is a demand of justice, but because Christian love transcends justice, the end of racism will mean that our community will bear fruit beyond simply the fair treatment of all, after all, quote, within the human family, unquote. As St. John Paul II said, quote, each people preserves and expresses its own identity and enriches others with its gifts of culture, unquote. Our faith gives us a treasury of inspiring holy men and women who courageously worked toward racial reconciliation, showing us the way forward. There is, for example, the servant of God, Augustus Tolton, who was born into slavery and escaped to the free state of Illinois. Despite a strong calling to the priesthood supported by the clergy who knew his faith, all the seminaries in the United States rejected him. Having eventually made it to a seminary in Rome, he was ordained and returned to serve as the first black priest born in the United States, where, again, he faced much discrimination and racism. Once home and ministering to the people of God, Friar Tolton was tormented by others, especially by a brother priest who was white. This priest made public and ugly statements urging the white people of the city not to go to Father Tolton's parish. Through this long persecution, Father Tolton exhibited the love of Christ, forgiving what was done to him and continuing to serve others. Things got so bad, however, that Father Tolton accepted an invitation from Archbishop Freehand to move north to Chicago, where he served the faithful until his death in 1897. Father Tolton often spoke of how the church had taught him to always, quote, pray and forgive my persecutors, unquote. During his ministry, Father Tolton corresponded with Mother, now Saint, Catherine Drexel, who helped support his parish work in Chicago. She is another example of people working for racial reconciliation. Following a directive from Pope Leo XIII in 1887, St. Catherine dedicated her life to working closely with Native Americans and African Americans, exhibiting genuine respect and concern. By the time of her death, in 1955, St. Catherine had more than 500 sisters working in 63 schools and had established 50 missions for Native Americans in 16 states. She had also founded 50 schools for African American students, including Xavier University of Louisiana, the first and only Catholic university in the United States established specifically for African Americans. Her motivation was clear. As she said, quote, If we wish to serve God and love our neighbor well, we must manifest our joy in the service we render to him and them. Let us open wide our hearts. It is joy which invites us. Press forward and fear nothing. Unquote. Walk humbly with God. To press forward without fear means, quote, to walk humbly with God, unquote, in rebuilding our relationships, healing our communities, and working to shape our policies and institutions toward the good of all as missionary disciples. Evangelization, which is the work of the church, quote, means not only preaching, but witnessing, not only conversion, but renewal, not only entry into the community, but the building up of the community, unquote. Racism is a moral problem that requires a moral remedy a transformation of the human heart that impels us to act. The power of this type of transformation will be a strong catalyst in eliminating those injustices that impinge on human dignity. As Christians, we know this to be true, for with, quote, God, all things are possible, unquote. Matthew 19, 26. It is the Lord who, by his grace, forgives and restores to us these relationships and heals the wounds between us. After all, the aim of salvation, history, is reconciliation and entering the heavenly Jerusalem, a communion of all peoples and all nations. To press forward without fear also means cooperating with God's grace by taking direct and deliberate steps for change. It means opening doorways where once only walls stood. As bishops, we commit ourselves to the following actions with the hope that others, especially those in our spiritual care, will do likewise in their own lives and communities. Acknowledging sin. Examine our sinfulness individually as the Christian community and as a society, is a humbling experience. Only from a place of humility can we look honestly at past failures, ask for forgiveness, and move toward healing and reconciliation. This requires us to acknowledge sinful deeds and thoughts, and to ask for forgiveness. The truth is that the sons and daughters of the Catholic Church have been complicit in the evil of racism. In his papal bull, Dum Diversitas, 1452, Nicholas V granted apostolic permission for the kings of Spain and Portugal to buy and sell Africans, setting the stage for the slave trade. Even though subsequent popes strongly renounced and rejected the international slave trade, 
Much to our shame, many American religious leaders, including Catholic bishops, failed to formally oppose slavery, and some even own slaves. We also realize the ways that racism has permeated the life of the church and persists to a degree even today. Quote, for too long, unquote, in the church's missions throughout the world, quote, the way to a fully indigenous clergy and religious was blocked by an attitude that was paternalistic and racist, unquote. Not long ago, in many Catholic parishes, people of color were relegated to segregated seating and required to receive the Holy Eucharist after white parishioners. All too often, leaders of the church have remained silent about the horrific violence and other racial injustices perpetuated against African Americans and others. Therefore, we, the Catholic bishops of the United States, acknowledge the many times when the church has failed to live as Christ taught, to love our brothers and sisters. Acts of racism have been committed by leaders and members of the Catholic Church, by bishops, clergy, religious, and laity, and her institutions. We express deep sorrow and regret for them. We also acknowledge those instances when we have not done enough or stood by silently when grave acts of injustice were committed. We ask for forgiveness from all those who have been harmed by these sins committed in the past or in the present. Being open to encounter and new relationships. Quote, to walk humbly with God, unquote, requires even more. We know that we do not have all the answers, but a missionary disciple is one who willingly meets every problem and every sinful attitude with the confidence that comes from a deep love of Jesus. As Pope Benedict XVI has said, quote, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction, unquote. The Christian community should draw from this central ongoing encounter with Christ and seek to combat racism with love, recalling the insight of Pope Francis that, quote, if we have received the love which restores meaning to our lives, how can we fail to share that love with others, unquote. With the guidance of the Holy Spirit, this wellspring of strength and courage must move us to act. Consequently, we all need to take responsibility for correcting the injustices of racism and healing the harms it has caused. To work at ending racism, we need to engage the world and encounter others, to see, maybe for the first time, those who are on the peripheries of our own limited view, knowing that the Lord has taken the divine initiative by loving us first. We can boldly go forward, reaching out to others. We must invite into dialogue those who ordinarily would not seek out. We must work to form relationships with those who might regularly try to avoid. This demands that we go beyond ourselves, opening our minds and hearts to value and respect the experiences of those who have been harmed by the evils of racism, Love also requires us to invite a change of heart in those who may be dismissive of others' experiences or whose hearts may be hardened by prejudice or racism. Only by forging authentic relationships can we truly see each other as Christ sees us. Love should, then, move us to take what we learn from our encounters and examine where society continues to fail our brothers and sisters, or where it perpetuates inequity, and seek to address those problems. Resolving to work for justice. To foster, in part, such encounters, and to express our strong and renewed resolve to work for justice, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops formed an ad hoc committee against racism. The committee has already begun its work, conducting listening sessions, providing resources about racism, giving tools to dioceses, epiaries, and parishes to begin important conversations about this evil, and exploring the needed policy initiatives. We charge this ad hoc committee to implement the vision of this pastoral letter. Furthermore, this committee is to develop ways to facilitate an ongoing national dialogue, bringing successful models and stories of hope to people at all levels. We also task the leadership of our bishops' conference to seek meaningful opportunities that deepen understanding, foster reconciliation, and public witness to the church's commitment to ending racism. We commit all the offices and committees of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to be ever mindful of this imperative. Nationally, taking concrete action should include advocating for equality in how laws are implemented and advocating for moral budgets that reduce barriers to economic well-being, appropriate health care, education, and training. We can also learn from the example of other countries such as South Africa, Germany, and Rwanda, and from certain institutions that have recognized past wrongs and have come to understand the truth of their history. Locally, including in our own parishes, practical plans should be made to provide further opportunities for qualified candidates who historically have been excluded, such as those hiring and contracting practices. Likewise, within our own diocese, taking concrete action entails that struggling parishes, schools, and organizations receive resources and training for catechesis, youth ministry, and other pastoral needs. It also means providing necessary support 
to families, seniors, and ex-offenders. In addition, quote, to overcome discrimination, a community must interiorize the values that inspire just laws and live out in a day-to-day -day life the conviction of the equal dignity of all, unquote. Therefore, we affirm the participating in or fostering organizations that are built on racist ideology, for instance, neo-Nazi movements and the Ku Klux Klan, is also sinful. They corrupt individuals and corrode communities. None of these organizations have a place in a just society. Educating ourselves. As bishops, we encourage our leadership to make formal visits to institutions of culture and learning, to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of American Indian, and the Holocaust Museum, all in Washington, D.C., and the Martin Luther King Jr. Center in Atlanta, for example. Similar opportunities should be encouraged in our local communities. Parishes, for instance, could use the National Day of Prayer for Peace in our communities, which falls on the Feast of St. Peter Claver, September 9th, to organize activities that foster community dialogue and reconciliation. These encounters will help open our minds and hearts more fully and continue the healing needed in our communities and our nation. By listening to one another's experiences, we can come to understand and to empathize, which leads to those right relationships that unite us as brothers and sisters. This justice finds its source and strength in the love of Christ who laid down his life for his friends. See John 15, 13. A change of heart, quote unquote, the Pontifical Commission on Justice and Peace points out, quote, cannot occur without strengthening spiritual convictions regarding respect for other races and ethnic groups, unquote. We must, therefore, form the consciences of our people, especially the young, quote, by clearly presenting the entire Christian doctrine on this subject. We particularly ask pastors, preachers, teachers, and catechists to explain the true teaching of scripture and tradition about the origin of all people in God, their final common destiny in the kingdom of God, the value of the precept of fraternal love, and the total incompatibility between racist exclusivism and the universal calling of all to the same salvation in Jesus Christ, unquote. Here we call on our religious education programs, Catholic schools, and Catholic publishing companies to develop curricula relating to racism and reconciliation. Our campus ministers should plan a young adult reflections and discussions that strive to build pathways toward racial equality and healing. We can also learn from the example of those young people who rise above racist attitudes and model respect. We also charge our seminaries, deacon formation programs, houses of formation, and all our educational institutions to break any silence around the issue of racism, to find new and creative ways to raise awareness, analyze curricula, and to teach the virtues of fraternal charity. Our individual efforts to encounter, grow, and witness, to change our hearts about racism must also find their way into our families. We urge each person to consider the dignity of others in the face of jokes, conversations, and complaints motivated by racial prejudice. We can provide experiences for children that expose them to different cultures and po peoples. We can also draw upon the incredible diversity of the church worldwide in providing education within the family and make it clear that God dwells in the equal dignity of each person. We ask all the faithful to consider ways in which they and their families can encounter, grow, and witness through an understanding and commitment to those values today. In turn, we pledge to provide tools and resources to facilitate those efforts. Working in our churches. Of course, racism will not end overnight. Still, we pledge those actions and hope that more actions will follow. We instruct our priests, deacons, religious brothers and sisters, lay leaders, our parish staffs, and all the faithful to endeavor to be missionary disciples carrying forth the message of fraternal charity and human dignity. We ask them to fight the evil of racism by educating themselves, reflecting on their personal thoughts and actions, listening to the experience of those who have been affected by racism, and by developing and supporting programs that help repair the damages caused by racial discrimination. We need to continue to educate ourselves and our people about the great cultural diversity within our church. One way to do this is to support actively the cause for canonization of the first African-American saint. We can also promote knowledge of the martyrs, blessed, and saints of the different cultural groups and nationalities present in our midst, and propose them as models of faith for the entire church. So many of our parishes are richly diverse, composed of people from various cultures and ethnic groups, such that they can be a model for the whole church and for the country. We will redouble our efforts to promote vocations to marriage, priesthood, and religious life, especially within communities of color, so as to better reflect all of the people of God. We commit to preach with regularity homilies directed to the issue of racism and its impact on our homes, families, and neighborhoods, particularly on certain feast days and national holidays. We direct our priests and deacons to do the same. We call on theologians to help us address these issues as well. In this task, it is essential to understand and to help others see how racism diminishes everyone, society as a whole, and not just those who are directly affected by it. 
changing structures. The roots of racism have extended deeply into the soil of our society. Racism can only end if we contend with the policies and institutional barriers that perpetuate and preserve the inequity, economic and social, that we still see all around us. With renewed vigor, we call on the members of the body of Christ to join others in advocating and promoting policies at all levels that will combat racism and its effects in our civic and social institutions, even in the developed world, quote unquote. Pope Francis told members of the U.S. Congress, quote, the effects of the unjust structures and actions are all too apparent. Our efforts must aim at restoring hope, righting wrongs, maintaining commitments, and thus promoting the well-being of individuals and of peoples, unquote. Certainly, we cannot accomplish this task alone. We call on everyone, especially all Christians and those of other faith traditions, to help repair the breach caused by racism which damages the human family. Ecumenical and interreligious cooperation has been pivotal at key moments in our history. For instance, in the abolition, <sighs> for instance, in the abolition of slavery and during the civil rights era, the leadership of the civil rights movement, especially that of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., invited ecumenical and interreligious cooperation as was seen when Catholics, Protestants, and Jews marched together. That spirit is integral to the fight today, and in some communities, the success of this effort will very much depend on this kind of collaboration. As religious leaders, we must continue this tradition. Conversion of all. As St. Paul proclaimed, quote, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these I am the foremost. But for that reason I was mercifully treated, so that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. Unquote. 1 Timothy 1, 15-16. St. Paul's own conversion is a powerful reminder of how God's grace can transform even the hardest of hearts. Prayer and working toward conversion must be our first response in the face of evil actions. Quote, I tell you, in just the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Unquote. Luke 15, 7. Therefore, we must never limit our understanding of God's power to bring about the conversion of even those whose hearts appear completely frozen by the sin of racism. Our communities must never cease to invite and encourage them in love to abandon these sinful thoughts and destructive ways. Conversion is an essential aspect of evangelization, which, quote, is a question not only of preaching the gospel in an ever wider geographic area or to ever greater numbers of people, but also of affecting and, as it were, upsetting, through the power of the gospel, mankind's criteria of judgment, unquote. Like St. Paul, this requires us to examine our most deeply held, quote, values, our points of interest, lines of thought, sources of inspiration, and models of life, unquote. All that may be, quote, in contrast with the word of God and the plan of salvation. Unquote. Our commitment to life. The injustice and harm racism causes are an attack on human life. The Church in the United States has spoken out consistently and forcefully against abortion, assisted suicide, euthanasia, the death penalty, and other forms of violence that threaten human life. It is not a secret that these attacks on human life have severely affected people of color, who are disproportionately affected by poverty, targeted for abortion, have less access to health care, have the greatest number on death row, and are more likely to feel pressure to end their lives when facing serious illness. As bishops, we unequivocally state that racism is a life issue. Accordingly, we will not cease to speak forcefully against the work toward ending racism. Racism directly places brother and sister against each other, violating the dignity inherent in each person. The Apostle James commands the Christian, quote, show no partiality as you adhere to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. James 2, 1. Going forward, almost 30 years ago, St. John Paul II reminded us just what is at stake. Each person, quote, is called to a fullness of life which far exceeds the dimensions of his earthly existence, because it consists in sharing the very life of God. The loftiness of this supernatural vocation reveals the greatness and the inestimable value of human life." Unquote. We are all called to that great life, to the communion of heaven where, quote, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue stand before the throne and before the Lamb. Revelation 7, 9. Unquote. That Lamb, Christ, showed us that the very life of God is love, and love requires something of each of us. We pray that the reader will join us in striving for the end of racism in all its forms, 
that we may walk together humbly with God and with all of our brothers and sisters in a renewed unity. For there is no place for racism in the hearts of any person. It is a perversion of the Lord's will for men and women, all of whom were made in God's image and likeness. We end by adopting the words of St. Paul. Brothers and sisters, quote, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Your every act should be done with love. Unquote. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. As in all things, we turn to prayer, asking our Blessed Mother to intercede on our behalf. Mary, friend and mother to all, through your Son, God has found a way to unite himself in every human being, called to be one people, sisters and brothers to each other. We ask for your help in calling on your Son, seeking forgiveness for the times when we have failed in love and respect one another. We ask for your help in obtaining from your Son the grace we need to overcome the evil of racism and to build a just society. We ask for your help in following your Son so that prejudice and animosity will no longer infect our minds or hearts, but will be replaced with a love that respects the dignity of each person. Mother of the Church, the Spirit of your Son Jesus warms our hearts. Pray for us. Amen. Below are some of my thoughts on the pastoral letter against racism, quote, open wide our hearts, unquote. In overview, bullet point one, I support the substance of the letter insofar as it calls us to recognize the common dignity of all humanity before God. Bullet point, I oppose the letter where it draws more from the tainted wells of identity politics and non-normalized statistics than it does from the Holy Scriptures. The first oddity is the definition of racism as Racism arises when, either consciously or unconsciously, a person holds that his or her own race or ethnicity is superior, and therefore judges persons of other races or ethnicities as inferior and unworthy of equal regard, unquote. And then quickly declares, quote, racist acts are sinful because they violate justice, unquote. I agree with this statement, but would agree even more if the words his or her own were replaced with one particular. Sadly, this will cause problems later on in the letter. The letter continues in good order before launching into a litany of examples which could very well be motivated by prejudicial racism, but could also be very easily motivated by entirely reasonable preferential inquiry, or even entirely objective socioeconomic factors. I consider these examples both misguided and misleading, and will address each one in turn. Quote, Hispanics and African Americans face discrimination in hiring, housing, educational opportunities, and incarceration, unquote. These groups identified are also statistically poorer than Asians and Wonderbreds, and when this factor is accounted for, the apparent racist prejudice against entirely the apparent racist prejudice nearly entirely disappears. One may make an argument that a lack of complete equity is indicative of racist prejudice, but as the USCCB clearly knows, Christ himself taught us that, quote, the poor you will always have with you, unquote. The later reference to, quote, structural and institutional forms of racist injustice evident in the economic imbalances, unquote, is even more alarming, as it seems to lean heavily toward the equity rhetoric which killed so many millions in the great Marxist experiments of the 20th century. Quote, racial profiling frequently targets Hispanics for selective immigration enforcement practices, unquote. There are two major borders with the United States, one with the wealthy and economically stable Canada, and one with the relatively impoverished and unstable Mexico. If Canada were poor and dangerous, no doubt there would be selective immigration enforcement targeted at those who end sentences with A, despite their overwhelmingly white skin. As it is, immigrant enforcement preferentially scrutinizing those who share common identifiers with a nation of origin from which most illegal aliens originate seems entirely reasonable to me. In any case, it does not unequivocally indicate either racism or injustice. Quote, Racial profiling frequently targets African Americans for suspected criminal activity, unquote. This is a tricky issue because it seems likely that blacks are indeed more often falsely convicted of crimes than those of other races. But I would like to object to what seems to be the underlying assumption that actual criminal behavior is exactly evenly distributed across all races, which, if you believe that, then, of course, the higher arrest rates among the black population are indicative of systemic injustice. But it seems like there are cultural reasons that we could point to, which could also explain the disparity, at least in part. The one that springs first to mind is the rate of single motherhood, and the point is that if the real crime rate is significantly higher in the African-American community, 
then we cannot realistically accuse law enforcement of racism for looking there first. Quote, there is also the growing fear and harassment of persons from majority Muslim countries, unquote. As with immigration, this attitude certainly could reflect racism, but we might just as easily discover less offensive causes in light of the shockingly violent, officially practiced in, quote, majority Muslim countries, unquote, and the doctrines of warfare and conquest, which are core members of the Muslim faith, fear and hostility seem rather justified. If Muslims do not wish to be feared and hated, perhaps they should submit to a more friendly body of instruction. And finally, while it seems quite true that, quote, extreme nationalist ideologies are feeding the American public discourse with xenophobic rhetoric that instigates fear against foreigners, immigrants, and refugees, unquote, the extremists are by no means the only cause of fear of outsiders. Perhaps the USCCB would like to recall the feelings of their predecessors toward Calvinists during the height of the Reformation. Would they question the walls which Catholic bishops built around their own estates in the 12th century to avoid being lynched by peasant mobs? There are legitimate reasons, if not for xenophobia, at least for xeno-suspicion. I would prefer not to judge men's hearts and minds by presuming to indicate broad cultural examples of racism. Where racism does exist, I do not dispute that it is a sinful attitude, which will tend to motivate sinful actions. But the examples given above seem to me very likely motivated, at least in part, by non-racist and even non-sinful drives. There is then some dancing with subconscious bias, which I distrust based on Dr. Jordan Peter B. Peterson's expert evaluation of such ideas. It is a warning well taken that our hearts are deceitful and that our consciences bear examination. Then comes this gem, quote, we must admit the plain truth that for many of our fellow citizens who have done nothing wrong, interactions with the police are often fraught with fear and even danger, unquote. Which is true. I believe for all citizens who have done nothing wrong, an upstanding citizen would like nothing so much as to be left alone by the police, regardless of their race. No doubt the USCCB would respond, but racism still profoundly affects our culture, and it has no place in the Christian heart. This evil causes great harm to its victims, and it corrupts the souls of those who harbor racist or prejudicial thoughts. The persistence of the evil of racism is why we are writing this letter now. People are still being harmed, so action is still needed. Unquote. And I agree. Racism is a sin, though it is only a subset of the scriptural other of, quote, the alien, the orphan, and the widow, unquote, which could use, in my opinion, a bit more attention. Regardless, let us proceed. To this outrageous conflation of patriotism and piety, quote, moving our nation to a full realization of the promise of liberty, equality, and justice for all is even more challenging. However, in Christ, we can find the strength and the grace necessary to make that journey, unquote. I need not point out that while Christ certainly loves justice. He by no means calls for universal equality and liberty, and so I shall not. Instead, I reference the instructed grounds on which to boast, in the knowledge that God delights in, quote, righteousness, justice, and loving kindness, unquote, and that if failure to live up to these ideals results in a dearth of equality and liberty, we should look to eliminating vice rather than racism. Again, we hear that, quote, if racism is confronted by addressing its causes and the injustice it produces, then healing can occur, unquote. And with this statement, I agree. But then it is chased by, one might even say, it drags behind it the conclusion that, quote, in that transformed reality, the headlines we see all too often today will become lessons from the past, unquote. Which would only be true if such headlines were utterly and entirely motivated by prejudicial racism, a premise which I deeply doubt. How do we overcome this evil of rejecting a brother or sister's humanity, the same evil that provoked Cain's sin, quote-unquote? I would be interested in hearing how the USCCB came to this reading, as Cain seems under no illusions as to the humanity he shares with Abel. Indeed, he seems to hate Abel's skin less than Abel's success. Anyway, if a further example from racism can be found than fratricide, I would be quite surprised. There then opens a new section, well watered with the scriptures and likewise refreshing. I would say that the assessment, quote, whether recognized or not, the history of the injustice is done to so many because of their race flows from this, quote, lust to dominate, unquote, the other, unquote, is well founded and fair. In this encouraging context, allow me to restate that I am in full accord with the substance of the letter as it pertains to the command to, quote, love our neighbor as ourself, unquote, which, on the whole, I gladly affirm it does. <laughs>
While I do not dispute the statement that, quote, many groups such as the Irish, Italians, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Poles, Jews, Chinese, and Japanese can attest to having been the target of racial and ethnic prejudice in this country, unquote, I think it equally telling that racism is vastly more prevalent, broadly accepted, and unquestioned in Ireland, Italy, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Poland, Israel, and China. I know from extensive first-hand experience that this is the case for Japan. So far from preaching to the choir, it seems possible that the USCCB is, in the instance of racism, railing at the choir. Certainly, we may be able to improve, but perhaps the choice of examples indicates that the log lies, in this case, in the eyes of the immigrants. We enter now on the section titled The Native American Experience, and rather than examine individual statements, I hope you will not resent my presenting an alternative viewpoint entirely to the one that the USCCB seems to accept. Before Europeans arrived, Native Americans had already developed a deeply racist and bigoted culture, refusing to live in peace and largely preferring factious warfare and hatred over justice and mercy. They were not unique in this respect, sharing the fallen nature of all mankind, and only lacked the sanctifying grace offered to all people through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the practice of the sanctifying works of mercy. With the Europeans arrived these divine tools, along with their very human stewards. Those of the Native Americans who responded to the gospel were gladly accepted into both the church and those roles in society well suited to their recent catechesis. Those who sadly clung to their racism, fear, and animosity were excluded from both the church and society and were thereby unable to participate with the followers of Christ in the liberty which he brings. It is true that the secular Puritan government treated them poorly, but no more poorly than any other insurrectionist group would be, which failed to conform to societal norms and recognized individual land ownership. It is no surprise that those who continue to choose cultural exile over cooperation remain at a severe disadvantage in nearly every aspect of life. The U.S. CCB rightly says that, quote, when one culture meets another, a lack of awareness and understanding often lead to grossly distorted value judgments and prejudice, unquote. But given the objective superiority, which one must, from a Christian perspective at least, attribute to the largely pious European culture, I doubt that genuine awareness and understanding would result in an outcome which the authors of this pastoral letter would consider acceptable. Racism may have been, quote, evident in how white European immigrants and pioneers acted in their encounters with the Native Americans, unquote. But it seems even more evident that those Native Americans who choose to identify with their own race and culture instead of with the humanity which they shared with the immigrants and pioneers, especially as those same immigrants and pioneers were apparently so eager to extend to them the benefits of society. If all societies are equal, then I see no reason for the USCCB to go so far out of their way to condemn our own for its racism. And if some societies are better than others, then it hardly screams of racism that our ancestors recognize the fact as well. Of course, as with all simplifications, reality is never that simple. Like with race and gender, we should not foolishly speak of cultures being universally better or worse, but specifically better or worse to some end and for some purpose. Men are worse at bearing children than women. Whites are worse at resisting sunburn than blacks. Likewise, I would hazard that Native American culture is worse at making the land fruitful than European culture, which should be significant to the Catholic bishops, considering the divine directive to, quote, fill the earth, unquote, which they ostensibly support. Buried under all this confusion, there is a fascinating discussion to be had about the nature of property ownership, but I suspect that we are some generations away from being able to hold that discussion, and even more from being able to profitably reach any conclusions. On the section titled, The African American Experience, I do not dispute the injustices outlined. Chattel slavery was, and in some nations, still is grotesque. However, I do wish to make two tempering points. First, that every horror listed was experienced by whites as well, and at the hands of whites. It could be well said that every racial group that mostly resided in extreme poverty and endured daily indignities in their interactions with members of their own race and with other races. Second, that injustices essentially identical to chattel slavery, though less formalized and, there, and thereby quite likely even less just, were practiced against wonderbreads by the Muslim nations of North Africa, and if the Wonderbreds were better able to resist this form of international predation, it is hardly a mark of deeply rooted moral failure. We hear again in the Hispanic experience 
of the apparently definitive argument that a large income gap between Hispanic and European Americans points to the persistence of certain discriminatory practices in employment and pay, when the pay gap could just as easily lie, as with women, in the higher emphasis encouraged by the church which Hispanics place on family life. Refer to, to the sixth paragraph, for my comments, on immigration enforcement. There also seems to be some confusion in the letter between immigrants and illegal immigrants. The terms are interchanged with such a casualness that it almost looks like an attempt at equivocation. This is like arguing that we should not be wary of illegal drugs because drugs save many lives every day. In general, where the letter draws from the scriptures, it rings true. Sadly, the scriptures are strangely absent in the love goodness section. If we have heard, when we begin to separate people in our thoughts for unjust reasons we fail to love, it could have been justified, but the USCCB saw it fit to interject the phrase, when we start to see some people as them and others as us, which I am embarrassed to be forced to point out, appear to be the entire point of having a Catholic church in the first place. If the bishops consider it unloving to divide people into them and us, then why do they speak as Catholic bishops, and not as Catholics, or as Christians, or simply human beings who share in the dignity of all humanity? As convenient as it may be to the immediate argument to hypothesize that othering is unloving, it is a completely absurd argument when given the least context. Even if all the wards of the members of the USCCB were racist, we are bound, at the very least, to exclude from this us, the blessed them comprised of the saints, who share God's presence. Quote, Fortunately, after page 17, it is smooth sailing and I have no further complaints, unquote, is what I was hoping to say until I reached the end of page 23. The various and vehement calls to holiness and repentance from racism are well taken to heart. Nonetheless, the USCCB stumbled again into the error of left-wing ideology when they inserted into the otherwise upright phrase, quote, Love should then move us to take what we learn from our encounters and examine where society continues to fail our brothers and sisters and seek to address these problems, unquote. The words, quote, or where it perpetuates inequity, unquote. If inequity is such a problem, the bishops of the United States might do well to resign their positions of inequitable authority. I can only hope that the word was meant in the sense of, quote, ungodly touting of moral superiority, unquote, and not in the intersectionality sense of any way in which any group is statistically inferior to any other. But honestly, taken in context, I would not say that hope is at all likely to bear fruit. The rest of the letter is concerned with implementation along the lines already laid out, and it would thus become repetitive for me to continue my commentary. Thus, allow me to restate that I oppose racism with my whole heart, and am highly skeptical of the capacity of the USCCB to define racism in such a way that it does not create more troublesome problems than it solves, given the problematic nature of the arguments they have offered in this letter. There are just two more topics I would like to address concerning the general thrust of the difficulties I have with the letter as a whole, thus I conclude this response with a few disorganized thoughts on the issues of cultural equality and collective responsibility. Responsibility can only be taken where authority exists. The two are inseparable. While not directly stated, I get the feeling that the USCCB considers Wonderbreads to have a responsibility for causing the failure of other races through racism. I have attempted to diffuse this premise in my objections above, but let us disregard my objections temporarily. If one race has responsibility for another, they also have authority over the other. And if they have authority, then they are not only partially responsible for the failings, but also partially credited with the success. If it would seem absurd to you for the successful black population to credit whites as the cause of their wealth, then it should feel equally strange for unsuccessful blacks to blame whites for their failure. And in both cases, the idea that whites have, as a race, authority over blacks is so absurd that even the USCCB could not state it openly. Let us assume the implication was unintentional. What can not be taken as unintentional is the USCCB's expedition into vaguely affirming the value of cultural equality in their own case against Europeans oppressing Native Americans. But the more strongly we defend, quote, traditional cultural practices, unquote, 
the weaker will our argument be against racism as a traditional cultural practice in the United States. Let us not allow a quagmire of feel-good multiculturalism to hinder our efforts in stamping out sin. As with the misguided examples, the argument against racism would have been stronger if less was said along these lines.